also. So I'm not particularly sure how many other people are going to be here for part of this conversation. Uh, my name is Will Prater, and I'm the creative director of Crash Course Theater. Welcome to our very, very, very first ABCD, a book club about drama. I know that should be ABCAD, but I thought ABCD was catch here. So uh, today we are joined by a dear friend and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Well, I'm Gwen, Gwen Diller, and uh, I love theater, but I'm a bit of a theater noob. So I consider myself a student. <laughs> awesome. Well, according to the book that we've read today, or the, the part of the book that we've read today, it strongly discourages uh, teacher slash student relationships because, um, and I kind of agree with that assessment as far as us all being both students and teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Gwen and I have been doing a little bit of preliminary chat and uh, we both decided that we feel like there needs to be like a whole series of discussions about this one particular book um, because it is, how many pages is this? Like 400 pages. And um, we both discovered a lot of meaty substance in this uh, to say that it is, uh, a difficult read, I wouldn't near say that, but I would say that uh, there's a reason why she is considered uh, the mother of improvisation. So uh, I guess I'm going to kick it over to you, Gwen, and see what your thoughts were when you were reading through this as a noob. <laughs> well... Um, I like how she talked about that we learn through experience and no one t actually teaches anyone anything. Um, and basically that, you know, if we have a comfortable environment, then we can learn whatever we want as long as we're comfortable to learn. And there's no such thing as talent or lack of talent. Um, yeah, that would kind of threw me for a loop, but I, I understood what she was saying. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, there are a few people that probably that can just pick up something and immediately just be great at it. Um, but a lot of talent comes from hard work and just practice and experience. So I think that I knew this was going to be deeper uh, just in the start of it. Um, the the way that. Um, Viola, I think is how you say her name. If I'm wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, not that she is going to, you know, come back and haunt me. Right. Um, but one of the things that she says is that uh, basically talent is the increasing of a person's capability for experiencing that the untold potential of a personality can be uh, evoked. Um, and one of the things that she said, she breaks it down into um, intellect, physical, and intuitive. And she says that the intuitive is the most vital part of the learning situation. And um, I think that that's very important because intuitive is a big part of improvisation. Having just the ability to not predict, but almost predict what other people are going to do and being able to, she says, don't react, just act. So I think that that's really interesting because I know that I am prone 
more to react. And when we think about typical theater, that's kind of what we think of. But this is a different type of, we'll say, skill set. Um, for Viola, it's it's built around the idea of, like you said, with people not so much having talent, but for their ability to catch things, their ability to learn from things quicker. And that is what she seems to think talent is. Now, that's neither a right or wrong thought. It's just a very different thought than what I've always thought. Um, I, you know, a lot of times I think, oh, well, I've been in this for 27 years. And then I realize that although I've been doing this for 27 years, I still feel like I know nothing. Because every time I think I know something, something comes along to show me this is not reality. So um, what is your experience, Gwen? I'm curious, as far as improv goes, I know that you are a voice actor, but with voice acting, there comes generally, I would imagine, a script. Exactly. So in voice acting, do you find that there are a lot of situations where you kind of have to work on an improv improvised muscle? It could be um, sometimes you might have to change uh, a character's perspective on something. So you kind of have to be able to think on the spot or, you know, I haven't personally experienced this yet, but in the classes I've been taking, um, if you are working on something, a lot of times, you know, if you're doing a character or, you know, you're portraying a character one way and then on the spot, you'll be directed to just do something totally different. Or, you know, now you're an old man or now you're a little boy, <laughs> you know, so like you have to be able to act on the spot and just kind of like adapt to that and just like, okay, how am I going to make this up, you know? <laughs> but yeah, there is often usually a script for sure. Uh, well, my personal experience, though, um, I'm a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, that is, yeah, it revolves around improv pretty much uh, a lot, at least interactions with the characters. Um so I thought that was fun <laughs> to read about. So when you do Dungeons and Dragons, do you find yourself uh, put in a DM role or do you find that you're a participant? A player. Okay. So, yeah. And, the you know, the, the Dungeon Master has a lot of things planned, but even what they have planned, sometimes if the players take a totally different direction, you know, anyone who's ever played before, you know, they'll know that you just it's he also he or she also has to you know act on the spot and say okay well how am I going to change the situation right. um you know all the character interactions are we don't have a script you know it's just like what am I going to say to this person what, how is my character going to act to this this, See, this I always, enemy <laughs> I always think of uh Sheldon from Big Bang Theory not because of my shirt although Big Bang Theory uh, Sheldon was always an interesting character when he played D and D because he would change his voices. And Jim Parson was just an incredible actor overall, or is an incredible actor overall. But he he got very very into D and D, and I know that a lot of the people that I've had the the delight of being around they get very, very involved in the storytelling of D&D. &D. And I know that that's built all around uh, improvisation. So I, I'm curious, you know, I wish that there were more people on here. I'm sure that we'll hopefully have other people joining us. I'm, I'm curious what it's at, like to actually step on stage and do some of these things. Because another thing that um, Viola talks about is the separation of the stage and the audience and how improv is supposed to be a bridge. It's supposed to acknowledge the audience. The audience is a participant in the improv. And 
I always think of whose line it, is it anyway. That's what I thought of too. So I, I look forward to the day when I'm able to be on stage and have that sort of interaction with the audience and both they're able to build off of my energy and I'm able to build off of theirs. So I just think that that's really interesting because as an actor, you, you learn about the fourth wall and you always try to keep within your space. When you break that fourth wall, a lot of people It's intentional. So even though it's breaking that fourth wall, it's not really so much about interacting with the audience because you're still playing a role. Right. And I think it's interesting because one of her seems to be uh, tax, uh, tactics is breaking that role you kind of ebb and flow and, you know, go in all different directions. And I think that that's really a challenge, uh, something that I think would be a lot of fun, but I also imagine it would be really scary. So, because if you drop the energy on stage, then automatically it becomes something more difficult for your audience to stay a part of. So I would love to be Wayne Brady though. I'm just saying. Like Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> I want to have that talent to be able to be that amazing. Some of the stuff they do on that show just blows my mind. Yeah, they um, I love that show. <laughs> the the one that I giggle at the most is generally when they do the songs. Yes, I love the songs. That blows my mind. I don't even know what to do when I see that because I want to have that kind of talent when I grow up. So um, so talking more about the book, she does, you know, kind of at the beginning of the book, she kind of lays down the foundations of some of her ideas. But I think it's interesting as she dives into these one of the things that got me was the workshop procedures and her talking about how to do a workshop for imp improvisation. And I was looking through it and she has 96 rules yeah. that you're supposed to follow when you do an improv workshop. And I'm just curious, did you have any of those that really kind of stuck out in your mind? Or what were your thoughts with regards to that? Let me see. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, while you're looking for that, one of the things that I was also doing was researching her other books. And I found another book by her that I actually had on my shelf. I've got a couple. But this one is Theater Games for the Lone Actor. And so I will be going through this within the next couple of weeks and just learning some of the other things that she chooses to do. Because I know for myself, a lot of times I think, well, if I'm by myself, then I don't have a way to practice. Yeah, and I'd be interested in that book, too. Yeah, she she definitely breaks that down for you. So. Yeah, I'm, as I'm looking through the book here, she talks a lot about just how, you know, your world around you and just being um, really attentive to the world around you and interacting. How how do you interact with the things around you? You know, how does it feel when you eat? It's al it almost reminded me of like mindfulness exercises almost. Yeah, I could see that. I think that it's interesting. She wants, she suggests the the who, what, where. But she says the how should never be answered. And I, I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective again. I, I mean, this book just, like I said, it just blew my mind. Because it's so different from 
every concept I've learned in the acting world and in life in general. So um, do, was there one point that you just kind of, your this thing went off in your head where you're like, okay, that's that's my big takeaway? Or was it more like just a an all around kind of thing? Um, so I'm realizing I wish I had a physical copy instead of on the Kindle because it's a lot harder to navigate. <laughs> well, I have a physical and I can um, definitely let you borrow it if you choose to. I also know they're on Amazon. Let me find out about that one because I was looking up a couple of other books. I did think the idea, the point of concentration was interesting. It's like to yes. preoccupy, you know, your mind. And and I think it's interesting that she says that's pretty much what you need to focus on for every exercise. It comes back to that same theory. Was there a list of the rules? I'm trying, or are they like? Yes, the list of the rules starts on page 36. And she calls them reminders and pointers. They're not. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these you look at and you're just like, uh, yeah, I, that one's a new concept to me. That one's a new concept to me. It just. All right. Since this is the Kindle, what section is it in? The workshop procedures? Uh, yes. It pretty much takes over the workshop procedures. She goes through um, the, the side coaching was interesting. I tried that out because there's a practice in the lone actors book about how to side coach yourself. Oh, that would actually be really helpful for voice <laughs> acting. <laughs> yes. Um, in the workshop procedures, she talks about problem solving and she talks once again about that point of concentration, which she also calls the point of focus. And she kind of breaks down her ideas on those concepts. She goes through evaluation. And it's interesting because she thinks that the idea of evaluation sometimes is what stops us from improvising. Because we're so scared of that judgment that we stop ourselves from being creative. Yeah. And I think that that's a really, really interesting point. Um, just how much I've allowed the evaluation to hang up everything. Uh, she talks about side coaching, which is basically talking to yourself from the sidelines or talking to somebody else from the sidelines. Mostly it's just the referee, for lack of better words. That's kind of what it is. It's the person that works on helping everybody else stay within the, the group, within the, that concentration of focus. And then she goes into how um, presenting a problem or creating a problem to solve a problem, which is, again, an interesting thing to do for yourself. Uh, she talks about the physical setup of the workshops and kind of how it's better to have it in a round formation rather than putting people in corners, sort of, and timing, of course. You have to give yourself sort of, how much time do I have for this particular practice? 
on page 36, she says it's a list of reminders and pointers for both students or group leader and stu uh, teachers and group leader or uh, and or the student. And the list is a bit exhaustive. Is it the numbered the numbered list? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ninety six things. Yeah, I found that finally. Um, yeah, I think like the not planning. I mean, I know that's the whole point of like improv, but you know, to not even be able to really think about what you're doing is really difficult. I think. Yes, I absolutely agree. Then also and, how she says, you know, don't say that someone was good or bad, but like, you know, did they solve the problem, you know, and how did they show that? Because we again come back to that evaluation that, you know, we we're giving other people our judgment rather than just allowing them to be. If you're only, your only goal is to solve the problem, which is your point of focus, then there is no good or bad. It's just a yes or no. So I think that that's definitely an interesting way to take it on. Um, some of the other things that she goes through is don't rush. And I think that that's funny because when I think of improv, I always think of something very, very fast. Well, especially with whose line, you know, you think yes. about go, go, go. <laughs> Yes. And I think that that's particularly interesting when you think about how long you've been practicing improv. When you're first practicing to release and let go of that preconception, then you have that freedom. Within that freedom, sometimes we don't know how to react. Where we live, we feel like, oh, well, this is too liberal. This is too free. There's got to be a catch. And then in improv, you figure out there's not a catch. That the freedom that you're getting from it is exactly what's supposed to be there. So I think that she also makes an excellent point of whoever is kind of leading the exercises to keep an eye on the energy of both the participants and the audience. And once the energy sort of changes, it's time to do a different exercise. So I think that that's, and that's one thing that I always find interesting about whose line, I know we keep going back to that, is that each of the activities they only last for generally two to three minutes and then it gets switched up yeah. because I think that you can only watch so many scenes from a hat before you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to move on to something else now. Right. So, and I always want, I wonder if maybe that's why they buzz them early sometimes. Like if they're, mm -hmm. maybe they're listening to the audience to see how they're reacting. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I definitely think that my biggest concern with regards to doing improv is that I have a very adult brain. And so a lot of the things that I would think of for improv, I would have to censor myself for, uh, which is why I want to learn how to do it both as a friend, uh, family friendly kind of thing but then I also want to give myself the freedom to be able to do a more adult style of improv. I think that I, I'm curious what your thoughts are, especially working towards creating a, an improv group. How do you feel it differs doing it in a smaller town? like Tullahoma versus building it up in say Nashville or one of the bigger cities in, in Tennessee. What are your thoughts? I don't know. Uh, I think 
Um, Telahoma is at least. I was surprised by the uh, by the involvement of the, or you know how big the theater is in the community and how many people were involved in theater in the community. <laughs> um, I mean, there might be an interest. Uh, I don't know if you mean like family family friendly versus not. <laughs> Uh, I think as long as you have clear um, expectations and clear, uh, you know, like this is what it is kind of thing, then you would be able to um, get the right people, I guess, that would be willing to younger people, probably, <laughs> Yeah. you know, college students. <laughs> I think that we're seeing an influx of a new generation because even in studying out the works that are in public domain versus a lot of the newer playwrights, you see a change in the way that they're writing. And I think part of that has to do with our attention span. And part of it has to do with just that snowflake, uh, snowflake, liberal kind of mindset where there aren't really any subjects or not very many subjects that are taboo anymore when you talk to the younger generation. Now, when you look at, you know, the 40 somethings. There's still quite a few things that um, I'll say we take issue with. For myself, I don't, it's very hard to offend me. But I know that some people don't have that same relaxed nature. And I think that one of the things that I was always taught about improv which I'm curious if she ever addresses this, is the ability to always say yes. No matter what scenario you're given, you know, if you get that ball, so to speak, thrown to you, you have to be willing to receive it, even if you change its direction. And I think that The ball exercise is definitely, there are a couple of things that I saw that I've done in theater that I didn't really realize were improv practices. So I definitely think that when forming a an improv troupe, it's very important to form it with people that you can trust. And I think that you made an excellent point of just making sure that everybody knows kind of how the game's played. And I think that that's an interesting, it, it's, 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 it's 96 rules long. I was thinking, it, Yeah. it, it's, it, it has no rules, but it has rules, Guidelines. you know, exactly. And I think that she does an excellent job of breaking down what those rules are. Um, those rules, which she calls reminders and pointers. So I definitely understand why she is considered the mother of improv. I'm sad that I'm 28 years into my study of theater and have never studied her out before. So... I definitely think that that is interesting and different and a little bizarre. Um, when you, did you get a chance to go through, because I know that we both got sucked into the meat of everything. And so uh, I ended right after she started talking about the practices because the practices were a little bit more difficult for me to wrap my head around because they involved multiple people. Uh, did you Yeah. get a ch chance to go through the exercises or, because I'm curious what you thought of some of those exercises. Yes, I think I did get through some.
Um, did you get through the like the exposure, like you know, when you first uh like divide the group? Yes. I thought that was interesting how you know there's the odd you're in a, there part of the group is the audience and part is the uh you know on stage and getting past that part, which that's like a big part, uh a big thing that's always held me back, I think, from just wanting to be on stage is like people seeing me, you know. <laughs> You feel like this book helped you to break through a little bit? I still have to experience it, but I think it gave me a different perspective, you know, like just kind of like, I, I like that exercise, you know, you look at us, we'll look at you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that got really uncomfortable very fast, and I was just reading about it. Yeah, So... because it's like, yeah, I'll just stand here. And I was like imagining myself as, you know, what I would be doing on the stage and you know, shifting from foot to foot or just looking awkwardly around, you know. <laughs> then she And gives I think them the it's, point of con or a uh, point of concentration, right? She doesn't yeah, tell them, though. yes. Uh, and I think it's interesting that that's how she starts out the practices, because that seems a pretty intense place to even start. Yeah. Uh, so one of the exercises that she talks about for anyone who has not had an opportunity to read the book yet Um, she breaks down some of the practices that can be used to help out in uh, helping people get more oriented towards improvisation. And one of the first practices she offers is breaking down the group into two parts and having one part on stage and one part in the audience and having them stare at each other until everyone is uncomfortable. And then she has them switch places. So the part that was on stage becomes the audience and vice versa. And after this is done, she goes back and does the same exercise, but this time she goes back to that point of concentration and she says, now I want you to count something or she gives them a particular task that forces them to focus. And then after having done both of those exercises, both the staring and the other task, she asks them questions about how did that feel? How did, uh, like, for instance, how did your stomach feel while you were doing this? Did you get uncomfortable? Uh, did the actors look when they first, how did the actors look when they first stood on stage when talking about how that would have created a certain amount of, of discomfort within the human body? Because very few people, if they're not used to being the center of attention, are just going to be like, hey, stare at me. So, yeah, I definitely agree with what you're thinking. So, I think rather than trying to discuss the whole book, I think what we may do is we may break this into multiple conversations because I know for myself, I didn't get much past the practices. Um, I actually didn't finish out all the practices. So I think I'm going to consider this a, uh, a part of a series. So rather than staying on here a full hour, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this in just the next few minutes. And that way we can come back to this and decide when we want to have the next uh, part of the improvise for the theater. Now, one thing I want whoever is watching this to think about is that the ABCD is meant to be a longer conversation piece. And so we're going to be covering multiple books within this series. So this will be a branch off of the ABCD, but we're still going to be looking at what book we're going to discuss next month. And I've got three suggestions, and I want to see uh, from you, both when and from anybody else who watches this, 
I would like to see what your thoughts are on what you would like to discuss next. So I've got three selections. All three of these are available on Amazon and they are priced anywhere from two to three dollars to up to twenty dollars. So I suggest getting a copy of these um, because you'll have a whole month to read them. And Amazon, for the most part, can get you next day delivery or something like that. So the first one I've got is called Small Stage Sets on Tour. This is going to give you, uh, it's called a practical guide to portable stage sets. So it's definitely something that if you're into stage building, this will help you out with that. So it's not just about small set, uh, small sets. It's about set building, period. So I feel like that might be an interesting one. The second book is The Three Uses of a Knife. And this is by uh, David Monet. And this is on the nature and the purpose of drama. So it's more of a behind the scenes kind of look at what makes good drama. And it comes at it from a playwright's perspective, which is something a little different than most of us get to see it from. And then the third book, really intrigues me. This is acting from a spiritual perspective. And I think that it is interesting to look at what a lot of us do and think about how it affects us in a spiritual realm. So I'm looking forward to it. And whether anybody likes any of these three books or not, I'm still going to read them anyway. I just may not read them in the next month. That's my share impression. It's terrible. <laughs> All right. So, Gwen, as far as you, of those three books, what do you think, since you're on here? I'm going to ask and put you on the spot. Hmm. Well, I mean, the third one seemed interesting. I would probably want to read, like, the little descriptions about them. Um, okay. I'd say... The second or third seemed the most interesting. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a picture of these three books, and I'll also put a link to each one of them where you can find them on Amazon. And I would love for anybody who watches this to take a few minutes, listen to this conversation, read through uh, this book. It is Improvis Improvisation for the Theater by uh, Viola Spoilin. I don't know how to say her last name. I'm so sorry if I say that wrong. She is considered the mother of improvisation. She also has a number of other books. And one of them that I'm going to be reading is Theater Games for the Lone Actor. So you're more than welcome to grab that, see your thoughts on it. And we will be back next month it will be the first sunday of the month as long as that date is open which i will be posting that definitely and we hope that you will be able to join us and i hope that you'll be able to be part of the next book discussion thank you so much gwen it was great to see you all right bye bye Just kidding. I don't know how to. Where is my? Oh, it's over there. <laughs>